There are many ancient out-of-place artifacts that we feel, due to academia's domination of popular opinion, are easily hidden away beneath a veil of secrecy. Countless intriguing, unexplained artifacts, all condemned to a mundane modern conspiracy pertaining to their true origins. Objects that, ironically, cannot be explained by these same individuals' so-called learned opinions, a fact that must clearly be beknownst to them, yet seemingly overlooked by the majority of the general public. We have previously covered many artifacts that, thanks to their existence, contradict most of modern academic opinion regarding the chronological timelines for the development of man. Many metallic artifacts, for example, that either due to their purity, size, or elemental rarity, fly in the face of currently attested views regarding their possible age. Developed undeniably through far more advanced techniques than were available to our more modern descendants, we have even covered extraterrestrial gold, once owned by Tutankhamun, now argued as having come to Earth via meteorites. These artifacts indicate a far more interesting, far older story for their origins and indeed their creators than academia would like you to believe. Beth Shearim, an ancient gigantic glass slab we have previously covered, it was once found within Galilee. Just like our object of focus, the Beth Shearim slab was unquestionably created within a refinery far too enormous for our well-studied, more modern ancestors. Just like the Beth Shearim slab, this enormous metal disk recently uncovered within Java simply cannot be explained with primitive ancient smelting techniques. Indeed, the melting, casting, and hammering of this amount of iron into such an enormous iron dish, according to academic views on history, is currently unexplainable making the Iron Disk of Java an out-of-place artifact. Predictably, after the successful excavation of the artifact and the careful, painstaking placement of it upon a transport lorry, it was mysteriously destroyed on the way to the museum, where it would have been on public display in full view of inquisitive minds. Clearly, once a pot of enormous proportions, and indeed once of a huge weight that, although most of these tons have rusted away, the movement of such required the utilization of a crane and transport lorry, a fact conveniently absent from any media explanations as to its ancient origins or usage. Who made the giant dish of Java? How did they make it? What did they use it for? Unfortunately, due to its destruction, it may slip away into the chasm of history, as with many other ancient oparts, missed by most and avoiding their deserved exposure within the modern age. In 1917, an amazing find was made in Indonesia. Entered into the report of the Department of Antiquities, the Dutch historian N.J. Chrome also mentioned it in 1949. Employees of the National Archaeology Research Center visited the site in 1979 for a study of its archaeology, history, and geology. If the claims are proven accurate, Indonesia possesses the oldest pyramidic structure on the face of the earth. Buried under a mound of ancient sediment. Located around 800 meters above sea level, the site covers a hill in a series of terraces bordered by retaining walls of stone, and is covered with massive rectangular stones of volcanic origin. The Sundanese people considered the site sacred, believing it was the result of the legend of King Siluwangi's attempts to build a palace in one night. Based on various dating techniques, the site has an official dating for completion by 5000 BC and quite likely much earlier. This pyramid is very old indeed. Interestingly the Lakan mountain in Borneo or rather, what the natives and tourists alike have known as a mountain for millennia, has also recently been confirmed to actually be an ancient pyramid. Drill samples from the tops of these mounds have provided carbon dates going as far back as 20,000 BC, the deeper they drilled the older the carbon dates became, peaking out at a layer of not local basalt at 90 feet. In West Java ancient knowledge had successfully been retained, indigenous communities claimed Egyptians landed, and even colonized Indonesia well before 2000 BC. 
The evidence for the colonization of Indonesia by the ancient Egyptians is documented by Sir Thomas Stamford Raffles in his volume, The History of Javum, 1830. Tomb paintings and writings show that the Egyptians were trading down the Red Sea and into the Indian Ocean. Were these structures actually created by Egyptians? Why were they placed where they lay? As I have mentioned before we know an awful lot about the Egyptian civilization, a lot of our knowledge from what they left us in written language, scrawled and hieroglyph all over these ancient monuments, we know about mummification processes in detail, we know all about their religious rituals, death practices etc, yet, alas, not one shred of writing on how they constructed such awe inspiring tombs, or why make them in the shape of a pyramid, out of millions of tons of accurately placed stone. Did the Egyptians just claim these structures as their own, as an illusionary appearance of power? A drought killed the ancient Egyptians, yet their supposed sphinxes show evidence of submersion, and thousands of years of heavy rainfall, this points a logical finger at an earlier creation date. With modern technologies, testing equipment, penetrating radar, and the internet, it appears the truth of who we really are, and who our ancestors were, may be revealed to us all. Who built the Boro Bodor, one of the largest yet most infrequently academically shared Buddhist monuments in the world? Supposedly built within the 8th century AD, it ranks as one of the greatest archaeological sites of Asia, if not the world. We have on many occasions covered seemingly unexplainable, enormous ancient monuments and ruins that we feel are attributed to a more modern inhabitant who, according to the same academic study, were undoubtedly severely lacking the capability to complete such builds. In other words, we believe that due to the inexplicable nature of their construction, and indeed often the scale of the stonework involved in these sites, they were instead seen as an advantageous place to re-inhabit. In doing so, these piggyback cultures created their own illusions of power. Obviously, claiming they built such awe-inspiring, intimidating structures would have immediately put any native adversary or any invading party on the back foot. A daunting task for any of our ancestors, merely armed with swords and catapults to have invaded. Sites such as the Great Pyramids, Sacsayhuaman, Kulap, or any other incredibly well-constructed ancient fortress or structure would have provided a superior level of security, a ready-built sanctuary, allowing their people to flourish and, in turn, giving our modern academia a culprit to pin the constructions to. Additionally, the religious idols, the artistically illustrated belief systems, and any leftover technologies would have been adopted by these people. Thus, we strongly suspect that religions such as Buddhism was in fact left to us by a highly advanced lost civilization, translated and embraced by our more modern ancestors. This adaptation of belief systems has conveniently allowed the furthering of the agenda of academia, yet the structure's inexplicable features are merely ignored by this group, rather than ever explained, this due to them simply incapable of explaining such constructions. This long list of worldwide unexplained anomalies, which grows in depth every day, is one of the main reasons why most of our taught history, we feel, is now obviously a lie. In truth, no one actually knows who built Baro Bador. They do not know when Baro Bador was built. And most important of all, they have no clue how it was built. The unexplained features within Baro Bador are greater in number than almost any other ancient site on Earth, and we suspect this to be the reason why it is rarely shared publicly. Yet, its past importance has not been overlooked by the modern world. Baro Bador, since knowledge of his existence was sparked in 1814 by Sir Thomas Ramford Raffles, then the British ruler of Java, who was informed of his existence and location by native Indonesians. Furthermore, speculation about an ancient lake which once surrounded Baro Bador was the subject of intense debate during the 20th century. In 1931, 
a Dutch artist and scholar of Hindu and Buddhist architecture, W. O. J. Nieuwenkamp, developed a hypothesis that the Kedu Plain, which surrounds the pyramidal structure, was once a lake, with Borobudur created to appear as a lotus flower floating on the water. We strongly believe that Borobudur, along with its curious architecture, is one of the most enigmatic, as yet unexplained, ancient site on Earth, and as such, highly compelling.